Hi everybody, welcome. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Linda Hughes. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, visions and how that's worked for my son. I um, see the picture you've got in the background just now, I believe there's a picture up that everyone can see. That's a picture of my son Jacob and his support worker Shannon and Amy who's a friend who lives, who, who works up the street from where my son lives. Um, I wear a lot of hats. I live in Newcastle with my son Jacob and we've been immersed in the NDIS since the launch back in 2013, all those years back. I've worked as a support coordinator and I do some work with a peer-led organisation in Newcastle called Community Disability Alliance Hunter or CEDA, who know it. I've more recently been working on a project with CEDA and the growing space called the Self Manager Hub and we'll be really shortly launching a website with all you need to know about self-management. I've also got a long association with family advocacy. And really today, a lot of what I'm talking about, family advocacy and resourcing inclusive communities, and what I'm talking about today really is a lot about what I've learned and um, from, uh, from my association with family advocacy and uh, the outcomes that that's brought about, the positive outcomes for my son. I'm also here with Cecile Sullivan Elder, who is the um, Executive Officer of Family Advocacy. Hi, everyone. And Clara, who is the Communications Person, and she is behind the scenes here making sure it all works for, all comes together well for us. So Hi, I'm, going to, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it will go to plan. So I'd like to... The next thing I'd like to do is um, acknowledge and pay my respects to the um, Awabakal people. I'm on Awabakal land in Newcastle right now, and I'd really like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Awabakal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners wherever you are, the traditional custodians, custodians of the land wherever you are. and just really want to acknowledge our appreciation for First Nations continuing um, connection with uh, water, land, culture and community. And I would like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and emerging and warmly welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. A little bit of housekeeping. We are recording the video. Um, we can't see you, but you can see us, hopefully, if everything's going to plan. We are recording the video, but um, we can't hear, we won't be able to um, hear you, so, or we won't see your voice or your image in the recording. We are going to have a quick poll survey as well. Uh, two questions at the beginning and one uh, at the end. So if you'd like to answer those, that just gives us a bit of a picture of who's with us and how this webinar has gone. Afterwards, um, at the end of the webinar or towards the end of the webinar, there'll be time for questions. So if anything pops into your mind during the, the webinar and you would like to ask a question, just click Q&A and put your question in there. If you're having trouble, if you use a screen reader or have any trouble accessing the Q&A, you can email your question to communications at familyadvocacy.com.au. That's communications with an S at family-advocacy.com.au. Afterwards, Family Advocacy or Resourcing Families will email you a survey to just see how the webinar has worked for you and, and just helps improve the future webinars as well. So please, if you get an, if, please, when you see that email, we'd really appreciate you completing that survey. And if you've got more questions or would like more information, you can certainly access Resourcing Inclusive Communities. So the first poll is, who is in the room? That's the first question. And the second question is, what's your understanding of the benefits of having a vision for yourself or your family member? So Clara, are you gonna able to launch that poll just now so people can answer that yeah. question? Thank you. We'll give you about 30 seconds. So hopefully it won't take too long, but just um, they're quick multiple choice questions. So please just quickly answer them all feedback the answers in a moment. Um, okay, I'm going to share the results now. Thank you. 
Okay, yeah. so we've got, uh, is it 4% of people are uh, people with disabilities and 93% are family members of people with disabilities and another 4% work in the sector. And uh, we, yeah, so that just gives us an idea that most people, 93% of people here are family members. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, are we ready for the second poll? Yeah. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, that was about a minute. We got most of the answers. Okay. Uh, and polling, share results. Okay, sharing the results now. Okay, so there's some people who've got no understanding or limited understanding. About 28% have limited understanding. About 67% have a good understanding. So hopefully, hopefully it will be useful for you hearing about our story today. Um, it's a pity we can't be interactive because it might be there might be things that you would like to share as well. But it's just um, with this many people in a webinar, it's just really hard to have that interaction going. So I'll just keep going then, shall I? I'll go to the next one. Oh, this is for you, Cecile. So I'm going to introduce you, Cecile. Um, so Cecile's the, um, the execu executive officer of Family Advocacy and she's just going to talk a little bit about what they do, what you do. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So welcome everybody. We're really excited that you're here. When, um, we're actually running this, uh, these webinars because we got a grant through information linkages and capacity building around self-management. <clears throat> certainly the last piece of that was uh, doing webinars and, and we really had to think through what, what is really, really important other than understanding the administrative and, and the opportunities that self-management bring, but certainly thinking through how that leads to people having good quality lives. So we're really excited that you're all here and uh, hope that you can be here for the three webinars and thanks very much to Linda uh, and Clara. So for those that don't know, Family Advocacy has actually been around for 29 years this year. It was founded by families that uh, wanted something different that was on offer for their family members with disability. Uh, many people back then, as they are now, were offered um, programs, um, activities, nothing normative that most Australians enjoy. So over the years, a lot of the work has concentrated on providing um, the advocacy leadership development of families um, so that they can advocate with and on behalf of their family member with disabilities about getting normative lives in community as well as systemic advocacy. So to counteract some of the issues that are going on uh, at a deeper level in a lot of the systems that are going on around the state and also the country. So we continue 29 years later to be governed by family members that uh, have the absolute interest of their family members at heart in relation to living inclusive lives in community. Um, and we're governed by uh, family members and allies of people with disabilities internally in the organisation. We also provide advocacy advice across the state um, for the many issues and barriers that people come up against. And um, now we've got some work that we're doing with the Disability Royal Commission. So we're trying to engage uh, as many people with disabilities and families across the state to actually give voice to the uh, multiple numerous many many issues that are going on for people with disabilities um, and on you know a lot of significant levels so in a snapshot that's family advocacy do you want to take me on to the next slide oh Whoever's... sorry yes sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, yeah so so one of the things that family advocacy did actually back in 2010 was launch an initiative at the time called resourcing families it's now changed its name to resourcing inclusive communities to actually look at um, particularly self-management is my understanding around how um, how we actually build uh, self uh, management um, in New South Wales and how do, what do we need to do to be able to make that more widespread as far as how people with disabilities were using their, their packages and the flexibilities around that. Certainly over the years since 2010, Resourcing Inclusive Communities has attracted a lot of projects that have aimed at uh, providing capacity building resources, uh, knowledge around um, people with disabilities living good lives in the hearts of the community. Um, so this, as I mentioned earlier, this current is this the end of a current one year project that we had that looked at self management. Uh, we're just about to launch um, excitingly a three year um, grant project around employment. One of the things that uh, we've absolutely identified is the employment of people with disabilities and pathways that are used whilst in school and post school are very, very, very poor. And so we applied for a three year grant 
we're actually trying to counteract that and, and increase uh, the percentages of people with disabilities, no matter what type of disability, moving into meaningful employment. So that's an example of uh, some of the sort of projects that we do through resourcing inclusive communities. And again, I'd just like to thank Linda uh, Hughes, who she's been associated with the organisation probably nearly as long as it's been around and, and look forward to listening to um, the webinar for the next 45 minutes. Thanks everyone. Great. Thanks Cecile. All right. So I just really think this is a really sort of uh, good place to start. And um, I think when I the, one of the most important influences that has been in my son's life is the is having a positive vision for him. Um, I really love this little slide here. Uh, let not our dreams, our needs determine our dreams, but our dreams determine our needs. And I just want to think about that for a second that our dreams drive us. We're in the relatively new world of the NDIS and very, very often I hear, what goals do I need to have to be funded for or to get this support? What sort of goals do I need to have in order to get a certain amount of funding? And it, it's probably um, a, an <laughs> Uh, an example of the NDIS not it's not goals and aspirations were really key to the NDIS but I think this is a little bit where we've found that, that, that the implementation doesn't quite work the way it was intended um, and we see goals causing a lot of angst for people so I just wanted today actually to take a step back and really think about behind goals that vision that dream so I hope you can bear with me and um, we can take a step back, sorry, take a step back and actually think about what we could dream for our son or daughter. Or if it's yourself, um, to look at the big picture, to dream and imagine beyond what we know is currently available for people with disability. And just a reminder today, our person, uh, our, uh, to, today that our conversation is centered on the person with a disability. I might use you, and that might be referring to a person with a disability rather than the family member. Um, but I just want you to remember that we are talking about a person with a disability as the focus. So this is Jacob. This is Jacob in his early years. And I thought it'd be really useful to start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. I'm mum to Jacob. As you saw on the front, he's now a man, 27 years old. Jacob has given me permission to talk about him today. Um, so Jacob now at 27 lives in his own home and he was sharing with a housemate up until recently, um, COVID sort of put a bit of car bosh on that. Jacob has um, a small business and he's got friends and a circle of support around him. Without doubt, the most important thing I learned, I think, with the was the benefit of having a, a positive vision for Jacob. It's probably been the biggest influence in the direction of his life. It's always given us something that we could talk about, that we could and we could strive towards. Before my son was born, I didn't know much about disability. Um, I probably believed the medical model that it was a tragedy. And then along comes Jacob, this beautiful, squishy, bouncy baby boy. And he entered the world also with a long list of deficits, and problems and needs, even before they were needs. We jumped into early intervention and there was a big emphasis on Jacob learning to walk and learning to talk. Somehow that would mean that he would get the good things in life. Um, and it's important, early intervention is important, but sometimes I wonder if we should have spent more time at the park with the neighborhood kids. Um, that's when, um, when I looked, when Jacob was young and I looked towards his future, I felt really uncomfortable. The path we were headed down was quite separate to the neighborhood kids. There seemed to be a life already written out for him, which was separate to most people. And at 18 months, I think, was one of the clear things at 18 months was uh, 
I was wanting to go back to work. So I was looking for childcare as, as parents do. And what we were recommended instead was a respite place at the local institution up the road in Ashfield. It just seemed so strange that that would even be an option. I was really puzzled by it. We rejected that option and we did find childcare. I really felt uncomfortable about Jacob going to special school and I could never really at the early days couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't like the idea of what his life would be like after school. I couldn't imagine it, but I didn't feel right either. But it was during these preschool years that I met family advocacy or came into contact with family advocacy. And I was hearing something different. I was hearing from parents who were talking about something different. They were fundamentally believe that their son or daughter should have the same opportunities as other kids to be included in the community and have a typical life, whatever way that was meaningful for them. And it wasn't based on overcoming disability or despite disability or in spite of disability. It was about being part of the community because inherently you inherently belong like everybody else. Learning, contributing, working and being in the same places that most people are. And something these families that I met with family advocacy all had in common was they had a vision, a positive vision for their son or daughter's future. And this vision actually ran quite counter to the life that was being prescribed for my son, that life that was written out, that separate life. In fact, so it just really inspired me to start thinking about something different for my son, Jacob. And I'm just going to say, I mean, unfortunately, there still remains, you know, entrenched barriers in our society that stand in the way of people with disabilities having the same good life as non-disabled people. There are failings in upholding human rights for people with disability, and they routinely denied inclusion and equality. But a vision gives you a picture of a future that's different and some strategies from that for the strategies that you need to, to make that life different for the person. And I can't imagine, to, I couldn't even imagine to tell you what sort of difference it has made to my son's life. I'm going to show you an early vision that we had for my son. The idea was that Jacob was going to live his very, very best life. Now, sometimes the word vision sounds really airy fairy up in the clouds kind of thing. It's, it's sometimes it's a, it's a funny word. Um, but in essence, it's a picture of the world or a picture of your family member's life, the way you want it to be. Organizations have vision statements, but really you could call it anything, a dream, a manifesto. You could call it blue sky thinking, your aspirations, etc. So here's our vision for Jacob to live his very best life, that his human rights will be upheld and he'll have the same opportunities that other children have. So it was written when he was a child loved and valued family member that Jacob would go to his local school and with the same age kids and have a stimulating learning environment and be known and appreciated as an individual with likes and preferences and choices respected that he has an opportunity to follow his passions and dreams and that he's well known in the local community that he has friends and people who enjoy hanging out with him those relationships are so important we would have really wanted Jacob to be having a job and earning money. So that's really important um, for people with disabilities. As Cecile was saying, that the new project will be looking at that. That Jacob's happy, healthy and safe. And there's nothing here in this vision that I would say is particularly outlandish or even outrageous. But this life, even at, this very, at a young preschool sort of age, this life was not going to be handed to Jacob automatically. We'd have, to, we'd have to go out and seek it for him. One of our colleagues, Wendy Strove, another person who's been associated with family advocacy for a long time, describes your vision as a compass. It gives you the direction that you want to go. So when someone, it lets you know what you're at, that you're heading in the direction of what you're aiming for. And we know sometimes that, you know, what we want for our family member might not actually be achievable, the barriers might be insurmountable. So we might have to find ways to work around it. It's sort of almost like um, if anyone 
sail has ever done sailing you sometimes you can't sail straight into the wind you have to tack which might mean that you go this way and then that way rather than straight to what you're aiming for and if you find it hard to think about what you actually want in your life, what your vision would be for, your, for, your, for yourself or your family member, think about what you don't want and then reverse it. If you don't want to be lonely, then that would mean that your vision would be to have friends and people around you who care about you. Writing a vision down helps you clarify your thoughts as well and it also makes it easier to share with other people so what I think um, the having a vision the benefits of having a vision for us have been that it highlights the importance of the person or in our case Jacob it really means that we've looked at the big picture of Jacob's life and his vision has evolved so that was just an early vision that I've shared but his vision has evolved the, and now he has ownership of that himself it really can change mindsets and, and um, possibilities about possibilities. And people can get really excited by that. People can really become, jump on board um, when you start talking about your vision. There's some people who'll be challenged and defensive, but generally we've sort of found it a really good way of bringing people uh, to the understanding of what we were looking for for my son. It moves you from reactive to proactive. Very often when people are working with, uh, well um, involved in the service system, um, you find yourself reacting to problems. For example, a friend of mine has her son in a group home and you know, almost daily there's a problem that she has to react to. And she's coming around to thinking about there might be another way of him living in his own home where they can be proactive and not reactive to the shortcomings of the service provider. So it brings people together around the person. It's strength-based. So it's based on a person's capabilities, interests, gifts, and skills, and empowers the person. And it helps the person have the right, you know, um, understand that they have the right to make the decisions in their own life and can have the right to be supported if they need it to make those decisions. It gives you talking points with others and determines your goals and your planning. I just wanted to also talk a little bit um, about the vulnerability that people with disability also experience. Um, along with the barriers to the good life, there's often a heightened vulnerability people with disabilities experience. And while we have the NDIS Quality Safeguard Commission that tells service providers to do the right thing, we also know that formal services um, do not get rid of the risks. They do not eliminate the risks and indeed can heighten vulnerability. Developmental investments, which is, is a kind of a funny little phrase, but it's a safeguarding framework that starts with the individual and invests in that person to build their capital in various areas. And by capital, I just mean the resources or the things at their disposal to help them things that are available to you. I don't have time to go into this in great detail, but when you're writing and thinking about your vision and a positive future, it's worth considering the importance of these, not only as life enhancing, but also as a safeguard. What's apparent though, is that developmental investments occur when a person is included in the community. And the more included a person is, usually the stronger the safeguard. So in particular, I'm just going to mention um, social capital because we relationships are like when people are asked around the world, if people are asking to survey what makes life good, relationships is usually the key thing that people come up with. But it's also a key safeguard. So being included in the community, knowing people and having people care about you is a really, really important safeguard as well as, as well as a, um, life enhancing aspect. The other one is worth mentioning as well is um, financial capital. When people are living in poverty, they have fewer, uh, they're more vulnerable. And certainly I just wanna just uh, uh, point back to the, the 
the project that resourcing inclusive communities will be running next on um, on helping young people from school into jobs. I'm not a great fan of this graphic, but I was really, really trying to find something that would help uh, demonstrate the vision, having a vision, how that would um, help you thinking about your goals. Sort of once you've got a, a vision and you've written it down and you've got a certain amount of clarity around it and you've brought people around, ideally people who um, can share that vision with you or you can share that vision with them and they're on board as well. The goals will just start to sort of fall out of it, it's sort of a bit like a cloud and rain will just fall from it. But I can't really find the right graphic for that. Um, I also just wanted to separate because sometimes people get vision and goals mixed up or they use the, the terms interchangeably, but the vision is the destination and got, this is where goals come into play is when goals come into play as they set the path. They are the steps in the process to getting towards your vision. Your vision may, uh, will evolve over time as your child grows up or as you grow up or if, if you're already a grown up um, and it will be more reflective of that person of your, the person's life you know ours has become much more reflective of Jacob's and they also change as life changes and life your goals will particularly in particular will change as you as life goes on as well so although we had a goal very early on for Jacob to be um, to live in his to not live with strangers at four years old that wasn't really a, an issue it was something that would come up in his 20s. You also might have something you need to concentrate on more than other things um, and it's hard to do everything at once. Uh, a few years ago we were trying to develop a small business with Jacob um, at the same time as establish a microboard and we just couldn't do both at once it was just impossible so um, one thing had to give. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's so just thinking about priorities and uh, and timing and and what's available at the moment. You'll also, no doubt, at some point, well, hopefully not, but you possibly will encounter some insurmountable barriers. Particularly, you know, if you seek an inclusive education for your son or daughter, you might find that you're locked out of the regular school, and you might so you might have to then find other ways of, of pursuing your vision. It might be that you seek ways that you, for your son or daughter to be included in after school activities that other neighborhood kids are involved in, sport or drama, or um, other uh, music lessons and things like that, or after school care even. If your child's older, and as is at special school, it's probably a really good time to start thinking about after school jobs. It would be terrific if we could just make a straight straight path to our goals, but unfortunately, we also find that that's um, it, there's just barriers there for people with disabilities, and the NDIS hasn't made them go away, but we do have some more options, I suppose. I also want to say it's never too late to have a vision, even if you're an older person or your son or daughter or family member is older. Um, and you might not have never ever had an opportunity to think beyond what's currently available or the traditional disability service sector. You might have just driven down that segregated pathway. And you might, and if you're not happy with the way life's going, you can start to think about that bigger picture and what your vision for your life or your family member's life would look like. I was really excited with the NDIS initially um, because, of the, because of the highlight um, within the NDIS or the, the objectives within the NDIS of, um, on goals and aspirations. It's one of the principles of the NDIS is that it's focused on people's goals and aspirations and that's really a po that's quite different to the the deficit model that Jacob had grown up with. 
And I think it has become problematic in the implementation of the NDIS. Goals can feel like this hoop that we've now got to jump through rather than personal objectives for a personal person's life. And goals, they can be really, really personal. You might not want to share your goals, your vision and your goals with everybody. You might not want to um, share them with your planner or your LAC or have them written into your plan. Uh, so that has to, so it's shared with every service provider. It might be that um, you have uh, uh, goals. Um, you might have goals around sexuality, for example, and you might not want to share those in your plan, but they're still your goals. So I think that there's, there's some issues here with the NDIS that we've still got to nut out around goals. Some goals are implicit. I don't think my son Jacob should have a goal for getting out of bed in the morning or to keep breathing. So that's a bit of a tricky one as well. But I'd encourage, and I'd encourage you before you go to the NDIS planning meeting, to do your planning beforehand. You, it's called a planning meeting with the NDIS, but really it's not the place to do planning. It's a place where you roll out your vision and your goals to the planner and lay it out to them. The planners and LACs do have pro forma uh, forms to fill in and they do tend to want to limit your the number of goals that you can have in your plan. Once again, goals are so intensely personal. It just seems remarkable that this is something that the NDS likes to have control of. You can insist that your goals, that your vision and goals, if you want them to be included in your, are included in the plan, you might wish to have them in the participant statement before the actual section for goals. And it's there in the NDIS Act that they must be included. So if just remember that if you've got a planner saying that you've got too many goals or they can't be included, just remind them of um, Section 33 of the NDIS Act. So we often hear that goals are rewritten as well. So once again, they're your goals, that's your wording. So it's that's, I suppose, that's what's really important is that your goals are yours. If you don't want to share them um, exactly how they are, then you have goals that you might just use for the NDIS, but still have your vision and your goals relevant to you. So you remember, this is Jacob now. Um, you remember we have had a, in Jacob's vision that we wanted Jacob to live in his own home or not live with strangers, I think it was, live in his own home and not with strangers. We were really concerned that uh, Jacob would live in a group home or an institution. That was a really big concern and, and a real fear. We know these places exist and still exist and uh, it could seem like a, an option for Jacob without strong safeguarding around him. Jake has a lot of difficulty communicating. He didn't say, I want to live in my own home. That's not the goal he said. What he did say was, goodbye, mum. Goodbye, mum. See you tomorrow, mum. When I return from being away on holidays or just away for the weekend, Jake would give me, what, you're back so soon kind of look. And he was also saying it was boring hanging out with me in the evening. So it really became obvious to us that Jacob was ready to move in, to have a home of his own. Jacob being settled in his own home is also an important part of our future planning and safeguarding for Jake. For a time when I'm not there, we want to make sure that Jacob is secure and settled. Now for us, it made more sense for me to move out because Jacob's our family home is wheelchair accessible. So I've moved to the house next door. So our plans and strategies that come from that goal are to bring Jacob's circle of support together. We rallied Jacob's circle of support and sort of 
gone a little, not gone, but it just um, wasn't as, um, we weren't meeting as often, perhaps not as more, more on a social basis rather than around particular the goals for Jacob. We reaffirmed our vision for Jacob. We did some planning and part, we used path planning. And um, if anyone wants to know about path planning, I'll add that as a resource at the end. Um, we, we did, we reaffirmed our vision for Jacob. And that included, once again, living in his own home. We required some support coordination because we really had to think about how Jacob could be supported to live in his own home. Uh, and the best way to find, work that out was to learn from others. In fact, I spoke to people from around the world who had sons or daughters with high support needs who were living in their own place uh, with supportive housemates. We had the house and home already, so that was one of our advantages. We needed to think about housemates, what to look for, and we created agreements and protocols. We needed training for support workers. And we also needed, uh, particularly around supporting Jake overnight, and we have a lead worker who supports the team of support workers. We supported, we need, Jacob needed support to build further relationships with his neighbours and other people in the community. And Jacob hosts regular shindigs, regular get togethers on at his place, bringing together his friends. We had also, Jacob did quite a few tryouts. That meant often going away on holidays without me or me going out with, going away without him. We needed AT supports. AT supports actually became quite important for overnight support for Jacob. So we needed to try, work out what would work really well for others to supporting Jacob overnight. A self-managed plan. I haven't talked about self-management at all to, to this point. And um, this webinar series is about self-management. We really couldn't do it this without self-management, having that flexibility. We directly employ support workers. That's, that's the way we choose to do it. And we needed some bookkeeping and HR support. Um, and we're working on the, the surf circle of support becoming a microboard in the future. Not all of these things in the list are paid support. Um, there are a few things in the list that we would find very difficult to do if we were agency or plan managed. So self-management makes it easier and do doable. So for Jacob, COVID's taken a bit of a toll with um, uh, his um, housemate wasn't able to stay. Um, it's kind of interesting because in the lead up to uh, li Jacob living in his own home, I had a lot of worries and and concerns and I literally wrote out 150 what ifs. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? Funnily enough, I didn't put down what if there is a global pandemic. So uh, we've had to uh, work with what we've got there and um, and I think for a lot of uh, Jacob as well as a lot of people have found that things have become a little bit more limited. Certainly it's very hard to do inclusion when you're in lockdown inclusion in the community. Similarly, Jacob's micro enterprise is, um, promotes accessible live and local and inclusive uh, events and music in Newcastle. And uh, that's taken a bit of a hit as well with COVID. So um, everyone's like, I think a lot of people, not just Jacob's, our lives are a little bit more around the home at the moment. But I do hope everybody is doing well as far as COVID goes. It just remains a concern. So, but Jacob is living in his own place and we keep striving for Jacob to be living his best life. And that vision gives us the compass that we need to get there. And I'm up to questions. I think I've been a bit faster than I anticipated. So, Clara. Yeah, no, it's Cecile. 
Cecile, sorry, oh, Cecile. Yeah, I'm the question asker. You're the question asker. Is there um, questions Thanks, everybody. There? Thank yeah, you. Look, there is questions, and thanks very much for that, Linda. We've got a combination of questions in the chat and in the Q&A, but I'll just say to everybody, if you want, uh, it's easier to put it in the Q&A, and that's right down the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that little icon, it'll give you the ability to write your questions directly in there. Uh, one question uh, we have is any advice on friends? My daughter Lizzie is 22 uh, and has Down syndrome. Her life is great, but we have not been able to generate friendship groups for her. Uh, she would uh, wants to be friends with her mainstream friends. Uh, we've been trying to manufacture friends with peers and not working at the moment. Any advice on that? Yeah, it, look, I think friendships is really hard and it's one of those things that um, is an ongoing um, something we all we particularly for people with disabilities we have to focus on ongoing um not just uh finding friends making friendships and developing friendships but also sustaining those friendships one of the things that i find really helpful is that jacob is in the place where he's with people who's who share his interests and i, I don't think i'm going to be saying anything that um you don't know already but thinking about being in the same places that people with people who share his interests at a, on a regular basis so turning up at the same time or joining the same group at the same time each week. Um, even if it's something like uh, an art class, turning up to the same art class each week, turning up to the same gym class each week at the same time, and you get to know the people who are there. And it does take time. Um, and then it's, I suppose then it's sort of finding those next steps where, well, how about after our class that we go for a, for a drink or for a, um, a coffee? and then sort of extending that. The role of support workers is really important here as well. I'll be talking a bit about more about that in a later webinar. Um, there has been a real tendency for support workers to become uh, just like friends. And I always, it, it always really concerns me because um, it's support workers are paid to be there. So by that very essence, they can't be your friend. They can be friendly that's important that they're friendly, but they're not a replacement for friends. On, on that point too, Linda, certainly the um, community connections webinar you've got as well, we'll probably touch a little bit on this. Yeah, we'll touch some more on that there, in cultivating relationships. But I think that the, the idea is using your support workers to help your son or your daughter in this case, um, with you know developing those friendships. It helps to have a team who understand that idea and we've just started actually mapping friendships for Jacob as well so there's people who Jacob knows who I don't know and maybe some of the people in Jacob's team know them but not everybody uh, so there's we've started mapping those um, on the app that we use for uh, for team sharing information so Jacob um, if he's hanging out with somebody then you know, we'd sort of snap a picture and, and everybody gets to know who this person is. So if they're with Jacob and they meet up with that person, um, then they've got some sort of context of who that person is because Jacob's not able to communicate that easily. Okay, thanks, Linda. The next one is, uh, can you please explain briefly a microboard? Ah, oh, microboard. Okay. I did share to the microboard Australia website just to yeah, more generalist yeah. information, but is there anything more you want to say on that? So a microboard really, um, it, in its very essence, it's a organization, an incorporated organization that comes around one particular person. So you'll be aware of um, of a, um, um, uh, sorry, you'll be aware of community-based organizations which have a board. They're, you know, not-for-profit organizations that have a board and uh, that run them. A microboard takes that idea, but instead of being around an organization and the goals and mission of an organization, it's around a person and the vision for that person. So it's people coming together to support a person to have a good life. It is usually often we have a circle of support people might be familiar with a circle of support so it's similar to a circle of support it's in fact taking a circle of support and making that a more formal role it's a volunteer role so once again it's people who care about a person with a disability coming together around that person yeah okay thank you linda we've got um how how do you get your own home in the community if the family aren't able to purchase a second home? Renting would kill the disability pension. 
Yeah, look, I don't have any answers there. Um, it is a situation where we were able to um, afford to move to the rental next door. Um, it's a pretty cheap rental. Um, so that, that made it pretty easy for us. But actually getting your own home remains uh, a problem. It's worthwhile looking at... Um, there's certainly there's if you're looking at sharing a house perhaps with non-disabled housemates who can provide some support you might be able to utilize some ndis funding to um, offset some of their rent there's it's interesting we're sort of there's people are working out ways to do this within the context of the ndis for a long time before the ndis there were people who were having sharing houses, not a lot of people, but enough people sharing houses with housemates and those housemates would might have a reduced rent or even rent free in, in exchange for support. The NDIS has sort of undone that a little bit, but they've just recently come out with something called independent living options or ILO, where the NDIS actually recognize these more unique type of living arrangements. So certainly a share house is a possibility and that's what a lot of young people do when they can't afford rent uh, to live by themselves, um, the rent of a house by themselves. Most young people, um, particularly around Jacob's age, live in share houses that, that share the, the cost of living between them. There's a really good uh, document that talks about the various options for uh, individualized living. Um, it's, it's called Supported Individualized Living and it's a document put out by Errol Cox at Curtin University and it's available on WA Individualized Services webpage. And that's a really good introduction to the various models of living in your own home. It certainly doesn't completely address the affordability issue. There's other things like social housing um, uh, that you could look at, but once again, wait lists are high. And there's SDA if you've got particular support needs that might be met by an S sorry specialist disability accommodation, which is an NDIS, which which has NDIS has funding for. But it is it is an area where which is really vexed, and I really hope that there's some uh, develop in the future that we're sort of there's more focus on affordable housing for people with disability. Yep. Thank you, Linda. Uh, okay, so could you provide us with more information about PATH planning? Um, yeah. Yes. So PATH stands for Planning Alternative uh, Tomorrows with Hope. So Planning Alternative Tomorrows with Hope, so that's your acronym for PATH. And it's a beautiful way of thinking about a person with a disability, who they are, um, what's working well in their life just now, uh, what's what needs improvement it's a includes your vision for yourself or you have the person um, it's if you can if you've got someone arty in your circle of support it can look really beautiful um, and I can share some uh, really lovely um, illustrations if you like of path planning ours doesn't look lovely it's on butcher's paper usually you put butcher's paper on the wall and it's it doesn't look so pretty but there's certainly others who've got artier um, and more talented members of their circle who can make them, you know, make the, 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 illust the path look really, really, really beautiful. Um, but yeah, I can share the resources on path planning. Yeah. And so this, on that too, like post the webinar, we will send uh, over the next yeah. few days a, a, an email to everybody that participated with a lot of links to a lot of different yeah. things. So, yeah. So the other thing just to add is that um, CEDA, Community Disability Alliance Hunter, have had they have workers who are trained in um, doing path planning with people. So that's probably only available to people around Newcastle, but certainly it's worth giving CEDA, uh, sending CEDA an email if you're interested in path planning and we might be able to see what we could do. Thank you. Now, the next one is around um, employing staff, Linda, so it might be relevant to one of the other webinars that you're doing, but I'll read it out. In choosing to directly employ staff, how much extra work uh, to administer as opposed to using contract type arrangements? Um, I decided to directly employ staff and I'm not going to cover this in the next one actually so it's, it's okay to cover it here if that's okay. Um, I could perhaps but it, there was other things that we're going to look at but I decided to directly employ staff because 
um, prior to the NDIS, we had what was called self-management in the um, in the state-based system, and we had an we couldn't directly engage staff, and we had an organisation that. I would recruit the workers and send them along to the organization and they would employ them. And um, they took a fair, fair, fair big fee for this. So, um, and there was things, there was quite a lot of, you know, there was limitations on what we could and couldn't do. Um, one of the things that I really, really wanted was a key worker, someone who could do the rosters, the timesheets, et cetera. Um, assist with training the state, the team um, and be the, key contact person uh, if, if you're sick if someone's sick I don't want them calling me they can call the key worker and she can start looking for a replacement worker um, so it actually was because I wanted to delegate more that I chose to directly employ and I wanted to get more bang for our buck so it actually means that I do less than if I was using an agency for the most part the actual having the key worker means that a lot of my the jobs that I previously had responsibility for that I've able to delegate to our key worker or lead worker so lead worker so title sorry. Okay, uh, thanks, Linda. Okay, I'm totally on board with this concept of having a vision and goals. I'm currently managing my two young autistic children's plans under the ECEI, and wonder if you have any tips on expanding our plans beyond just early intervention. We have just been given funding under CORE, but finding it very ambiguous uh, how we use our funding to help achieve our vision for our kids to become the best version of themselves rather than the focus being on them being normalised. Yeah, look, that's really interesting. Um, I, I Look, I don't have any, you know, I think that just once again, articulating your vision and ha hoping that the planner will understand it or the LAC or the the um, the person who's doing the planning with you, um, the early childhood partner would will understand that your vision it's it 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 does come back to um we started a vision for my son without any funding at all it was well before well 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 before the ndis it was you know 23 years ago that i think we first started you know writing it down um so it does it's it, the vision isn't necessarily dependent on funding it's sometimes back again good you froze just for a split second oh then. did i yeah. <laughs> okay. or maybe just on mine i'm not sure okay um yeah, so I think that the idea of um, your vision is really independent of funding. It's the, it is your starting point and your goals come from there. Now, those goals might be funded goals or part of them might be funded or they might be things that you can actually seek in the regular community which don't require funding. Um, you know, if, um, an example might be... Um, uh, for my son, I always think, oh, we should have spent more time in the park rather than going to early intervention. And I often wonder if the physical, um, the physical supports and the physical, his physical needs would have been just been as just as well met on the slippery dip, um, as well as uh, social needs. I think so. I think that it's really worth looking at what's already around um, in your neighbourhood, which may not be NDIS funded, and that's where your vision can be really useful and sort of in thinking beyond just funded supports of course funded supports are really are really useful as well but it's not the only part of the of um of what you need to have a good life okay thanks we've got a quick question what are at supports oh sorry at i use jargon i to think about that a bit more sorry assistive technology so um so for Jacob, when we were looking at him living in his own place, um, one of the biggest issues was him being safe overnight. There's a number of issues, health issues that Jacob has. So we looked at what AT supports would help, assistive technology would make him safe at night um, and, um, and purchase that. So it hadn't so much been required with me doing overnight support. But certainly, um, when other people are providing that overnight support, then it became quite, quite the requirement. Okay, we've got a couple of questions that are similar around finding uh, a key worker, uh, and and what what should you look for? And obviously, that's very related to the vision piece. Even though you're doing a uh, recruiting piece later in another webinar, so I'll put it over yep. to you. So, recruiting a key worker. Yeah. What, okay. to look for, what to look for, look, what to look for. So what's yeah. that? Yeah. Well, our key worker, um, her original career is in winemaking. Um, 
So it's um, it, what we needed was someone who was smart and savvy and able to uh, to lead a team. And they're the skill set we were looking for. We I'll talk about more this this more next week. But it is really important to actually think about the skills you're looking for in a person who's providing support. Um, so we've got job descriptions for all of the roles supporting Jacob. Some of them overlap. Some of the job descriptions might overlap. So the personal care attendant might also assist Jacob in the community. But we have we do have those roles quite quite written out. Um, so that people understand what they're, what's required. But it also helps us understand when we're recruiting. So we've always just, um, I've been recruiting my son's support workers, uh, oh well, gosh, 13 years now, I think. So we just, there's various ways of doing it. Initially, when Jacob was younger, we used to put an ad out at the university. More recently now, we're inclined to uh, put an, um, to advertise on seek i've got a theory at the moment we're not looking for workers but at the moment i've got a theory that there's a whole bunch of support workers out there who don't know their support workers yet they might be people who've worked in retail or in hospitality who found themselves unemployed and they're people who've got beautiful customer service skills etc uh, very obliging very caring and they just don't know yet that they're a support worker so i'm sort of really interested in tapping into into that that area Okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions around, um, I suppose, Jacob's home and how that was created. Uh, one of them is around um, how you arranged for housemates. Uh, and the other one is around, um, you know, the, I suppose the difficulty of setting up a home to start with and sort of any advice around that for somebody that uh, has an intellectual disability. It was really quite a, a process. Um, and it took a long time. So it was one of those goals that we had over two years uh, to even to get it to a Jake to achieve it. Um, just even really understanding what would work for Jake to be safe and um, to be safe in his uh, living in his own home. Um, and as I said before, I wrote out at the time um, I wrote, I had a lot of anxiety about, about Jacob, um, being well and safe and happy in his own home. And I wrote out a hundred and I think 152, what if this happens? And it might, it was everything from, you know, what if the housemate turns out to be a sociopath or to, um, you know, what if the pipes burst in the middle of the night, what's going to happen then? Um, we didn't write down what is what happens if there's a global pandemic because but most of the time we actually were able to come up with solutions to those things so we actually worked through each of those uh what ifs um and found strategies to mitigate or uh to reduce the risk of or to solutions if that happens so you know if the water pipe bursts in the middle of the night then pretty much the same thing is going to happen than if i was here with jacob as if, as if jacob was here with housemates um so the model that works for each person, you know, will be quite individual. So I think that's really worth doing the research. The document that I just talked about before, the written by Errol Cox, is really quite useful um, in looking at the various ways people can set up a home of their own as well. So I would really recommend having a look at that. And it's quite holistic. It's not just about your house. It's about being included in the community, knowing your neighbours. Um, it really is quite a holistic look, although the focus is on living in your own place. Um, I've forgotten the rest of the question, Cecile. <laughs> You're muted just now. Uh, it was tips around starting that process, which you might have covered anyway. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Look, I I would be talking with a support coordinator who understands, or somebody, or families who understand who have done it before. I think that this is. It's certainly, you know, I was working as a support coordinator at the time and I engaged somebody as a support coordinator to help me through the process. I think that it's not just a matter of. Um, turning up to a group home and, and moving in it's there's there's far far more to it there's more work at the front end but i think ultimately it's far more rewarding for the person with a disability yeah and i'd like to add too so through resourcing inclusive communities we're actually doing a uh, consortium grant with belonging matters in victoria and we're going to be focusing on creating a home and, and the different models and, and examples of that and resources and all the rest of it uh, certainly we haven't started that piece of work majorly at the moment but as that um, comes and becomes available will everybody know so i'd encourage you if you're not actually on resourcing inclusive communities email um, updates to certainly jump on and do that and you'd go straight to the website and actually 
uh, sign up to that to actually receive information as that comes out. That's awesome. And I just, Cecile, the other thing I was just thinking of is Jake's Place. There's a video on resourcing inclusive communities, mm. which we talk about that a bit more, Jacob's House. Yeah, and I'll actually put that in the follow-up email as well. Okay, great. So... Great. Wonderful. Well, I think that that's, um, we're getting to the end of the time, Linda, so it might be a yes, good time so just, to wrap up. And Yeah. So yeah. we've got one more poll to do. We're oh. gonna, we don't, won't have time to reveal the answer to this one, uh, but it will help with the planning of future ones. And the question is, do you feel more confident um, writing down a positive vision for yourself or your family member? So we'll give you a few minutes to answer that as well. While we're waiting for those other results, I'll, I'll get on and give you a bit of a plug, Linda. That okay. um, some of the some of the questions that have come up, and uh, we didn't get to all of them, but some of them are very much relevant to the next two webinars that we'll be doing with Linda. So um, certainly, if you haven't registered and you're interested, I'd I'd encourage you to jump on and, and register. Okay. Okay, and thanks to everybody who's joined us today. I hope. We've just started you thinking really about having a vision if you hadn't already started it. Um, there's a, some more resources at Resourcing Families and this is the contact details for resourcing, in, sorry, resourcing inclusive communities and at family advocacy. So there's some contact details there. I think I've got a link here to some of the resources we've discussed. The Self Manager Hub will be live shortly with lots of resources both around self-management and around those individual ways that people can be supported. There's some great planning resources with WA Individualised Services. My Choice Matters has some really good easy English resources for people with intellectual disability. Uh, Crew Good Life has good life resources and talks that matter. And finally we're just acknowledging that this webinar was funded by an NDI NDIA through a ILC strategy grant. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. And I think Friday is the next one. And we'll be talking about managing teams. Thank you.